Today, we're going to do a deep dive into all things Oscar. First, let me start by telling you about the statue itself. And I'm reading from an article online from historyfacts.com. One of Hollywood's most famous figures stands at just 13 and a half inches tall, weighs only eight and a half pounds, and goes by just one name, Oscar. The famous golden statuette is awarded annually by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and is one of the highest honors in the film industry. Like a lot of old Hollywood lore, there have been competing stories through the years about how the little gold statuette officially named the Academy Award of Merit got its human nickname. Here are some prevailing theories on how this prize statuette came to be known as Oscar. The first Academy Awards ceremony took place in May 1929 in the Blossom Room of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and introduced the gold-plated solid bronze statuette that has been an iconic Hollywood image ever since. Motion picture art director Cedric Gibbons designed it and sculptor George Stanley brought to life the knight holding a crusader's sword standing on a reel of film. The film reel's five spokes represent the original five branches of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Actors, directors, producers, technicians, and writers. Although the Academy Awards and its traditional statuette have been around since 1929, the Oscar name wasn't officially adopted by the Academy until 1939. The exact origin of the nickname, however, is fairly murky. One widely circulated legend attributes the moniker to the Academy's first librarian and eventual executive director, Margaret Herrick. According to the story, in 1931, Herrick saw one of the statuettes on an executive's desk and said it reminded her of her uncle Oscar. A newspaper reporter who happened to be nearby overheard her and the nickname stuck. There are some inconsistencies in the story, however. Herrick later claimed the name Oscar came from an inside joke with her husband. Another popular, though unlikely, theory is that the actress Betty Davis said in a 1936 Academy Awards acceptance speech that the statuette's backside resembled that of her then-husband, Harmon Oscar Nelson. And yet another oft-repeated legend is that Hollywood gossip columnist Sidney Skolsky coined the term when he used it in a 1934 story about Katharine Hepburn's first Academy Award for Best Actress. According to Bruce Davis, who spent 20 years as the Academy's executive director, the Oscar nickname began to make its way through the Hollywood community sometime between 1930 and 1933, predating Betty Davis and Sidney Skolsky's use of the term. Davis suggests someone else entirely deserves credit for inventing the Oscar alias. A woman named Eleanor Lilleberg. Lilleberg was an Academy secretary and office assistant during the award's early days, and part of her duties included managing the statuettes before the ceremony. Stories have occasionally surfaced that she jokingly called the award Oscar, which Davis claims is the true origin of the name. While researching his book, The Academy and the Award, he came across an autobiography by Lilleberg's brother, California artist, Einar Lilleberg, at the tiny Lilleberg Museum in Green Valley, California. Einar's text claimed that his sister referred to the awards as Oscar in honor of a Norwegian army veteran she knew in their hometown of Chicago. Einar described the veteran as, like the famous statuette, always standing straight and tall. Since 1939, the Ampas has accepted and used the Oscar's name as the official shorthand for its annual ceremony. As you can tell from my use of the clapboard, movies are in my DNA, and it should come as no surprise that fashion is a passion of mine as well. That's why last month, I took myself over to the National Arts Club to hear Esther Zuckerman, the author of Beyond the Best Dressed, the cultural history of the most glamorous, radical, and scandalous Oscar fashion. Her book, which is illustrated by Montana Forbes, is an exploration of the best of lists and a discovery of the fascinating stories behind some of our favorite fashion moments. 
She romped through a handful of influential outfits in Oscar history, from show-stopping to elegant to decidedly kooky. The Academy Awards telecast is decidedly my favorite TV night of the year because it's devoted entirely to glamour. I'm going to walk you through a handful of gowns from the past that Esther shared with us, starting with the gown that Jennifer Lopez wore, which evidently launched Google Images. Legend has it, I think it's not legend, I think it is kind of fact, that the dress that Jennifer Lopez wore on the red carpet, not to the Oscars, I'm sorry, led Google to create one of its most popular features, Google Images. As former Google CEO and executive chairman Eric Schmidt wrote on Project Syndicate in 2015, people wanted more than just text. This first became apparent after the 2000 Grammy Awards where Jennifer Lopez wore a green dress that, well, caught the world's attention. At the time, it was the most popular search query we had ever seen, but we had no surefire way of getting users exactly what they wanted, JLo wearing that dress. Google image search was born. I couldn't find any reference to Jennifer Lopez wearing this at the Oscars, only the Grammy, but... In any event, during her talk, Zuckerman remarked, what does what you're wearing say about you? What do you think this gown says about J-Lo? Edith Head designed the ivory lace gown worn by Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday, 1952. This gown was also adapted and worn by Audrey to collect her Oscar for the same film in 1954. It was made of ivory guipure, the bodice cut high and straight at the front with slender organza shoulder straps, lightly boned rayon under the bodice with sweetheart neckline, the back cut low over a full circle skirt with matching belt. Her bust was 81 centimeters or 32 inches and her waist a mere 61 centimeters or 24 inches. In the film, however, the dress has a low neck with a matching jacket and hat. In 1954, when Audrey was nominated for the Oscar for Best Actress for that film, it seemed that when faced with the decision of what to wear, she chose the beautiful lace dress worn in the last scene of the film. It may have been designed by Edith Head, but she Givenchy-fied it. Having suffered the privations of a world war, Audrey had something of a make-do and mend mentality. She could never just throw something away and preferred to adapt a gown or give it to someone else to wear. The basic dress was in Edith Head creation, but the new bodice plunging low at the back with pretty spaghetti straps was undoubtedly inspired by the gown she'd been wearing by her beloved Givenchy. Faced with the dilemma of whose dress to wear, she probably was hoping to appease both sides. Joanne Woodward won an Oscar for the Three Faces of Eve. She decided to make her own gown. I think it cost only about $100. Zuckerman did a whole bit on how in 2000, South Park did an episode mocking Gwyneth Paltrow for her pretty pink dress. Everyone who was alive the year that Bjork went to the Oscars to sing her nominated song will remember this swan dress. Zuckerman thinks that she was poking fun at the whole idea of this dress up thing because she even brought eggs to lay on the red carpet. Michelle Williams won an Oscar for Brokeback Mountain um, in 2006, Best Supporting Actress, this gown was designed by Vera Wang. Williams was giving a nod to the silver screen stars of the past by way of her soft finger waves that were given a modern update by cascading into face framing curls secured in a low, loose side chignon. Her luminous makeup followed the same retro-inspired aesthetic, a classic rouge lip and thick fluttery lashes. 
but the look felt undeniably fresh against the buttercup shade of her chiffon gown. Pink seemed to have a prevailing arc at this year's Oscars, perhaps motivated by the box office smash Barbie. Here's a, a few examples of people wearing pink, most notably Ryan Gosling, who in this image is surrounded by a group of male dancers reminiscent of Marilyn Monroe, also in shocking pink, surrounded by a group of male dancers in very similar tuxedos with these cross chest sashes as if they're ambassadors or princes from her film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. I just wanted to point out in the background is George Chakiris, who later starred in West Side Story. Speaking of West Side Story, one of the most famous actresses from the film is the indomitable Rita Moreno. Now, Rita Moreno got a lot of attention by Esther Zuckerman because this woman was able to don the same gown that she wore in the 60s to accept her Oscar for West Side Story as she wore to the Oscars when West Side Story was remade by Steven Spielberg. So here's a picture of that beautiful gown, slightly different, but the skirt is unmistakable. Here she is at this year's Oscars. This was her tribute to her co-star who recently passed away, Cheetah Rivera. Doesn't she look fabulous still? She's currently age 92. Could you believe it? Here she is with Rock Hudson giving her the award back in the 60s. What a great, great story and great career she's had. And this woman chose to not wear a gown at all. Of course, she's not an actress. I think she was the director of one of the films. But I thought this was very, very stunning, even though she opted for the tuxedo look. Here's a couple of other gowns from this year's Oscars that I thought were particularly pretty. 